Hello everyone, welcome back to another session in Dentistry and More. Today we have a new topic in uh, anatomy that is development of tongue. The tongue uh, we had covered, a part of tongue we have covered in dental histology that was about uh, the papilla and epithelium of tongue. So this uh, video is about the development of tongue, how it develops from the pharyngeal arches. So regarding the pharyngeal arches, this we had covered in anatomy previous session. So it was a detailed uh, description of how the pharyngeal pouches uh, giving rise to the various structures in head and neck region. So this is particularly about the development of tongue. So let's see the development of tongue in detail. So development of tongue, as we all know, Tongue is the largest single muscular organ inside the oral cavity which lies relatively free and uh, the tongue develops in relation to the pharyngeal arches. So pharyngeal arches uh, we have seen previously pharyngeal arches. Uh, we have 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 pharyngeal arches and pouches and uh, the pharyngeal clefts all we had uh, studied in detail. So this is also developed from the pharyngeal arches because most of the structures in head and neck region is developing from the primitive pharyngeal arches. So the first arch is known as mandibular arch. It is always bilateral. Second is, uh, second is a hyoid arch. From mandibular arch, uh, various structures like mandible, malleus, incus. Uh, the second arch is known as hyoid arch. Uh, the cartilage is known as Rachel's cartilage. The first arch uh, cartilage is known as Meckel's cartilage, uh, which gives rise to various bones and ligaments. So the tongue develops from pharyngeal arches mainly in two portions, that is anterior two third and posterior one third. So the anterior two third of tongue. So we need to learn few structures from which the anterior tooth develops. The first one is tuberculum impar. Okay, this red color which is present in the first arch. Okay, that is tuberculum impar. Or you can have redrawn it is here. This is a tuberculum impar, this red one. So it starts as a swelling in the middle of the mandibular process. So this is a mandibular process or the mandibular arch. So it starts as a swelling arise at the middle of the mandibular process and is flanked by two other swellings. So these are the two swellings which is present on the either side. So these swellings are known as lingual swelling. So the two lingual swellings and tuberculum impar which is present in the first pharyngeal arch. Okay. And these lingual swellings, uh, they are present on the lateral part of the mandibular process, which are the mesenchymal thickening, which develops to form uh, the lateral uh, sides of this tuberculum impar and ultimately the anterior two third of tongue. So these lingual swelling, which merge with each other and forms a mucous membrane of anterior two third of the tongue. Okay, so lingual swellings and tuberculum impar forms the anterior two-third and there is a structure which is known as foramen cecum which differentiate the anterior two-third and posterior one-third and these lateral swellings what happens is they quickly enlarge and merge with each other and the tuberculum impar to form a large mass so these all will merge which is. these two will merge and this merge with this tuberculum impar this lingual swelling they quickly enlarge and merge with each other and then also with tuberculum impar to form a large mass from which mucous membrane of anterior third of the two third of the tongue is formed and this anterior two third is supplied by trigeminal nerve so that we will uh, learn in detail the nerve supply and what about the posterior one third so this is the posterior one third okay this is the posterior one third it's the posterior one third so this posterior one third of the tongue arises from a large midline swelling 
which develops from mesenchyme of second, third, and fourth arch. Okay, so this anterior two third develops only from first arch, and the posterior one third develops from second, third, and fourth arch. So the development of tongue involve first, second, third, and fourth arches of primitive pharynx. Okay, so it involves one, two. Three and four arches. So this has two structures, which is known as copula, which is associated with second arch. Copula. Copula is uh, associated with second arch, and there will be a structure which is known as hypobranchial eminence. Copula is a part of second pharyngeal arch, whereas the hypobranchial eminence is part of third and fourth pharyngeal arch okay so the posterior one third develops from second third and fourth arch the anterior two third develops from first arch first arch is also known as mandibular arch okay so posterior one third is developing from second third and fourth arch so posterior one third is having two structures one is known as copula and the hypobranchial eminence so hypobranchial eminence having the cranial point and caudal point. Cranial point is towards the head and caudal point is towards the tail. And the copula is another structure which is present in the posterior one third. So what happens when the growth is happening? So this hypobrachial eminence which overgrows. Okay, so these uh, root of the tongue. So this is a posterior one third or root of the tongue which arises from the large midline swelling. Okay, so these midline swelling, so it has both copula and, so there will be copula, copula and hypobranchial eminence which is present in the midline at the posterior part. So what happens is, this hypobranchial eminence which overgrows the copula, which overgrows copula and there will be uh, separation from floor of the mouth. Okay, so how this separation from the floor of the mouth happens is, when the tongue uh, overgrows or this posterior one third or the hypobranchial eminence overgrows uh, the ectoderm which is present at the bottom will be degenerated okay and creating lingual sulcus so before it was a complete uh, mass of tissue but at the bottom point the ectoderm which is present in the periphery will be degenerating and creating lingual sulcus okay so when lingual sulcus is created, the tongue will get its mobility. So tongue needs to be mobile. So there will be degeneration of ectoderm which is present at the periphery and creating lingual sulcus. Okay. So the posterior one third is uh, supplied by glossopharyngeal nerve whereas anterior one third is supplied, uh, supplied by trigeminal nerve so the muscles of the tongue which have a different origin they arise from the occipital somites which have migrated uh, forward in the tongue area carrying uh, with them their nerve supply that is hypoglossal nerve so hypoglossal nerve is supplying the muscular tongue muscular hypoglossal nerve So there are lots of uh, nerve supply involving tongue, it's taste sensation, uh, general sensation. So anterior third is supplied by trigeminal nerve, especially mandibular nerve, posterior one third by glossopharyngeal, taste sensation by facial nerve. So um, that's about the um, developmental part of tongue. That is the anterior two third and posterior one third. How it develops? Anterior two third develops from mandibular arch or arch number one, and posterior one third is developed from arch number two, three, and four. So you need to uh, remember the structures which is giving rise to anterior two third. That is lingual swellings and tuberculum impar. There will be two lingual swellings, and between that there will be tuberculum impar. So all these grows and merge and forming anterior two third and there is something called as foramen cecum so which is uh, separating anterior and posterior one third 
So posterior one third is developing from copula and hypobranchial eminence. So hypobranchial eminence overgrows copula and there will be degeneration at the bottom part which is creating lingual sulcus and providing the mobility of tongue. So tongue uh, basically has three parts uh, that is uh, a root, a tip and a body. Okay, so this will be the root, this is the tip and this body. And the body has a curved surface, upper surface is known as the dorsal surface. You cannot differentiate with, because uh, this dimension and the dorsal and the dorsal surface which has the papilla mm, and the inferior surface or the ventral surface, okay, which is closer to the floor of the mouth. So this picture shows the oral part and the pharyngeal part, the same tongue, we are separating the anterior two third as oral part and this is a pharyngeal part of the posterior one third. Sulcus terminalis which is the junction of anterior and posterior one third and also we have uh, a structure known as foramen cecum which is a small midline depression at the border between this oral and pharyngeal portion of the tongue. And we have at the most posterior part the epiglottis. Now let's learn about uh, the papilla of tongue. So this we had covered in dental histology. Anyway, we have four types of papilla basically fungiform papillae, filiform papillae, foliate papillae and circumvalid or valid papillae. Okay. So each papillae is uh, assigned uh, sensory function that is a taste sensation. These are the projections of mucous membrane which gives the anterior two third of the tongue its characteristics roughness. So valid papillae, these are the valid papillae which is present in front of sulcus terminalis which is the largest papillae which has a blunt entered cylindrical in shape 1 to 2 millimeter in diameter number is 8 to 12 uh, which is occur in a v-shape uh, whereas the filiform papillae which is makes the majority of papillae and covers the anterior part of tongue they appear as slender thread like keratinized projections and it doesn't have any papillae because it is completely keratinized and these papillae facilitate mastication by compressing uh, and breaking food when tongue is opposed to hard palate. Uh, so that was the filiform papillae. Next is the fungiform papillae. And the next papillae is uh, fungiform papillae which is uh, mushroom shaped and more numerous uh, which is present uh, near the tip and margins of tongue but some of them are scattered all over. They have smooth round structures that appear red because of their highly vascular connective tissue core and they have taste buds. Okay, so these taste buds seen within the epithelium. Now we have foliate papillae which is, sign, uh, which is present at the side of the uh, tongue. They are uh, leaf like mucosal ridges bilaterally at the sides of tongue near sulcus terminalis and this also has taste buds only the first one that is filiform papillae is not having any taste buds and the pharyngeal part regarding the posterior part um, it is lies behind the palatoglossus glossal arches which forms the anterior wall of oropharynx okay so from here we have starting the pharynx so anterior wall of oropharynx which doesn't have any papillae and the mucous membrane has many lymphoid follicles that collectively constitute the lingual tonsil so all these follicles are known as lingual tonsil and on either side it has palatine tonsils so we are talking about the dorsal surface so we have the ventral surface that is closer to the floor of the mouth it is covered by smooth mucous membrane there will be a thin strip of tissue that runs vertically from the floor of the mouth to under surface of the tongue which is known as lingual frenum uh, we can feel the lingual frenum inside out uh, floor of the mouth and tongue at the, at the junction and uh, it tends to limit the movement of tongue so lingual frenum is a structure which uh, prevents the tongue movement <coughs> and on either side of frenum there is a prominence uh, which is produced by deep lingual veins are more laterally which is known as uh, plica fimbriata okay plica fimbriata plica 
Ka Fimbriata is nothing but on either side of this frenulum there is a prominence produced by deep lingual veins which are uh, more laterally and it looks like a fold which is known as Plica Fimbriata which is present on the ventral side okay next is the arterial supply so the main artery which supplies a tongue is lingual artery lingual artery uh, which is a branch of external carotid artery which is uh, reaching the tongue after passing deep to the hyoglossus muscle which divides into dorsal lingual artery deep lingual artery and sublingual artery okay which is dividing into dorsal deep lingual and sublingual arteries so this dorsal lingual artery supplies the posterior part and the deep lingual artery supplies the anterior part and the sublingual artery supplies the submandibular gland and floor of the mouth okay so lingual artery it divides into dorsal lingual artery deep lingual artery and sublingual artery and also we have tonsillar artery and ascending pharyngeal artery which is supplying the most posterior part of the tongue whereas the venous drainage we have a dorsal lingual vein which drains the dorsum and sides of the tongue and also deep lingual veins which drains the tip okay so this is a deep lingual vein uh, drains the tip and it joins sublingual vein from the sublingual gland okay so sublingual gland is drained by sublingual vein so this deep lingual vein joins with sublingual vein okay this two will join and all these ultimately terminate directly or indirectly into internal jugular vein so that is about venous drainage so we have dorsal lingual vein which drains the dorsal part then the deep lingual vein which drains the tip then it joins to sublingual vein which was uh, collecting uh, or draining the sublingual gland it both joins and ultimately all joins to terminate in interjugular vein now we have uh, nerve supply mm, nerve supply is uh, supplied anterior two third and posterior one third so we have general sensation and also taste sensation so the anterior two third the taste sensation is by cauda tympani that is a branch of facial nerve whereas the general sensation is by lingual nerve which is a branch of mandibular nerve which is again a branch of trigeminal nerve okay whereas the posterior one third but uh, this doesn't include valate or circumvallate uh, papillae which is the taste sensation which is present in the anterior two third so the taste sensation is by facial nerve that is a cauda tympani nerve except circumvallate papillae Whereas the posterior one third, the general sensation and taste sensation is by glossopharyngeal nerve, including the circumvallate papillae. Okay. And the most posterior part is supplied by vagus nerve through internal laryngeal nerve. And the muscles, regarding the muscles, all the muscles are supplied by hypoglossal nerve, except the palato uh, glossus muscle, which is supplied by vagus nerve so i repeat so anterior two third the taste sensation by facial nerve and general sensation by lingual nerve which is a branch of mandibular nerve which is again a branch of trigeminal nerve so seven and five nerve numbers and the posterior one third glossopharyngeal nerve general sensation and also taste sensation including the circumvallate papillae which is present in the anterior two third and the uh, most posterior part is supplied by vagus nerve through internal laryngeal nerve and all the muscles supplied by hypoglossal nerve except palatoglossus muscle palatoglossus muscle is supplied by vagus nerve now we have the lymphatic drainage okay so the lymphatic drainage so the tip of tongue is drained into submental nodes and then directly to deep cervical nodes so the tip this is a tip it goes to submental submental lymph nodes okay submental lymph nodes then to deep cervical node deep cervical node that is tip 
and the right and left half of the anterior two third uh, drain unilaterally to submandibular node. So this is anterior two third. The right and left is goes to submandibular node. Okay, submandibular node, submandibular lymph node. So I am talking about lymph node. Okay. So before we studied arterial supply, venous supply, and nerve supply, now we are in lymph nodes. So the anterior to the right and left are are going into the submandibular nodes, whereas the posterior one third. So this part is drained directly and bilaterally to deep cervical node. Okay, so this directly goes to deep cervical node. This is unilaterally going to right and left submandibular nodes the deep cervical nodes usually involved in jugular omohyoid and digastric nodes so this deep cervical nodes goes to jugular omohyoid and jugular digastric jugular omohyoid or jugular digastric okay so that is a uh, lymphatic drainage tip goes to submandible it goes to deep cervical node anterior to third from right and left unilaterally go to submandible posterior one third bilaterally directly goes to deep cervical deep cervical is associated with jugular omohyoid or jugular digastric uh, now we have few uh, developmental disturbances of tongue the first one is microglossia Microglossia, uh, it is a rare congenital anomaly manifested by the presence of rudimentary or very small tongue. The condition uh, when tongue being completely absent is known as agglossia. Okay, agglossia is a condition where the complete absence of tongue. So this condition we had studied in dental histology uh, in developmental disturbances. So classification uh, could be uh, True micro uh, microglossia and uh, relative microglossia, so it can be corrected by auto correction or speech and language development. Uh, macroglossia is a uh, condition when patient have an enlarged tongue. Okay, macroglossia, which could be associated with the Down syndrome, uh, back with uh, Widman syndrome, and there will be associated many problems such as noise breathing, uh, drooling, slur speech, uh, scalloping, open bite, cracked tongue. Uh, Ankyloglossia is nothing but a uh, condition where the tongue is fixed to the floor of the mouth. That is ankyloglossia. And it can be either complete ankyloglossia or partial. So partial is known as tongue tie. Tongue tie is a common condition. It is a partial ankyloglossia. So it is happening uh, due to the short lingual frenum or due to a frenum which attaches too near to the tip of the tongue. So we know tongue is like this and lingual frenum is attached here. So when it is attaching to the tip, there will be limited movements of tongue and ankyloglossia will happen. But the complete ankyloglossia is a result of fusion between tongue and floor of the mouth. So complete fusion will be there. So there will not be any movement for tongue. And uh, cleft tongue is a complete cleft tongue occurs due to the lack of merging of lateral lingual swelling. So when this is supposed to merge here with hyperbranchial eminence, when this fail to merge, there will be cleft tongue. Fissure tongue is, a, so that was cleft tongue. And fissure tongue is a malformation manifested clinically by numerous small grooves so when this is the tongue so there will be numerous small grooves present in the tongue okay on the surface of tongue so that is a fissure tongue uh, next we have uh, muscles of uh, tongue various muscles intrinsic and extrinsic muscles of tongue now let's see the muscles of tongue so we have two categories in muscles of tongue that is Intrinsic muscles which is not attached to any bone and which alter the shape of the tongue and extrinsic muscles they are attached to various bones. The intrinsic muscles are superior and inferior longitudinal, transverse and vertical. Whereas the extrinsic muscles 
they are genioglossus, hyoglossus, styloglossus and palatoglossus. So intrinsic muscles, they are four paired intrinsic muscles originate and insert within the tongue. Okay, they are not attached to anywhere else. They are originated and inserted within the tongue. They are four pairs. And these muscles basically uh, alter the shape of the tongue. So in intrinsic muscle, the first muscle is superior longitudinal. It originates in submucous fibrous layer below the dorsum of tongue and lingual septum. This is a superior longitudinal. It is just a diagrammatic picture on the frontal view, anterior section. And insertion, it extends to the lingual margin. Its action is it shortens the tongue and turns the apex and sides of the tongue upward. Okay, so apex and sides of the tongue upward. And uh, it makes the dorsal surface concave. Whereas the inferior longitudinal, this is, uh, where is inferior longitudinal? This is inferior longitudinal. It is a narrow band which is close to the inferior surface of tongue. Its origin is root of the tongue and insertion is at apex of tongue. That also action shortens the tongue whereas it makes the dorsum convex. Okay, it makes the dorsal surface convex. The superior longitudinal makes the dorsal surface concave. Turning the upward tip of the tongue up makes the concavity and tip the down it makes a convexity. Uh, next pair of uh, intrinsic muscle is transverse. Transverse is like this. Okay. So it is a median fibrous septum and insertion is at the margin of tongue. So this is the tongue means it will be inserted. It, it's running in transverse direction. Okay. So it inserted in right and left borders of the tongue. Action narrows and elongates tongue. Okay, so it is narrows and elongates. Whereas the vertical uh, muscle fibers, they originated uh, at the anterior part of tongue, inserted at the ventral surface and borders. Action flattens and broadens. Okay, flattens and broadens. Flattens and broadens is a function of vertical. Whereas transverse function is narrowing and elongation. Okay, narrowing and elongation. This is just opposite functions, the transverse and vertical fibers. So they are the intrinsic muscles. The, the, they are not attached to any bonds. They are just present its origin and insertion within the tongue. Now the extrinsic muscle, we have styloglossus and palatoglossus attached to tongue superiorly this is attached to tongue superiorly and genioglossus and hyoglossus attach the tongue inferiorly to the genioid bone and hyoid bone this is to the styloid process and to the palatal bone okay so all are attached to one bone this glossus means tongue this is attached to genioid bone this is attached to hyoid bone this is attached to styloid process this is attached to Palatal bone. So genioglossus. So we can see the main part of tongue. Genioglossus. It arises from superior genial tubercles above the origin of geniohyoid. Inserted the upper fibers to tip of the tongue. Upper fibers to the tip of the tongue. Middle fibers to the dorsum and lower fibers to the hyoid bone. And its action, upper fibers re retract the tip, middle fibers depress the tongue and lower fibers protrude the tongue. So that is genioglossus. It has upper, middle and lower fibers. It's starting upper fibers from tip of tongue, then uh, middle fibers from dorsum and lower fibers from hyoid bone. And its action is retracting the tip, then middle fibers depressing the tongue, lower fibers protruding the tongue. And next one is styloglossus. Styloglossus origin from styloid process. Insertion into the longitudinal part of the inferior longitudinal muscle. And function, it elevates and retracts the tongue. The hyoglossus muscles, it is a quadrilateral shape muscle. And origin from the 
hyoid bone insertion into the lateral surface of tongue function depress and retract the tongue the last one is palatoglossus its origin from the palatine aponeurosis insertion into the lateral margins of tongue action elevates and uh, elevates the posterior part of the tongue so that was about uh, various muscles they are intrinsic and extrinsic muscles intrinsic muscles not attached to a bone but extrinsic muscle attached to a bone okay so the movements of tongue okay so the intrinsic muscles are basically involved in broadens the tongue it flattens the tongue it turn the tip upward it turn the tip downward and the sideways movement whereas the extrinsic muscle they are involved in protrusion retraction depression and elevation protrusion is done by genioglossus on both sides acting together retraction is done by styloglossus and hyoglossus on both sides acting together depression of tongue is done by hyoglossus and genioglossus on both sides elevation is done by styloglossus and palatoglossus so depression and elevation you can imagine the structures which is present above the tongue and below the tongue so these are the uh, muscles that is uh, extrinsic muscles involvement in the movement of tongue so that's how we complete a tongue so we learned about the uh, development of tongue from the anterior to third posterior to third all these parts lingual swelling tuberculum impar copula and hypobranchial eminence then we learned about the arterial supply the venous supply the lymphatic drainage the nerve supply the muscles of tongue that is intrinsic muscle and extrinsic muscles so it is a very common question uh, you could expect the development of tongue the arterial supply uh, venous and lymphatic drainage could be a short knot nerve supply could be a short knot and also the muscles intrinsic muscles and extrinsic muscles and you may expect each one muscle as a short knot like genioglossus like styloglossus so i have not explained each muscle in detail so when question asked about single muscle you need to draw a neat label diagram and explain its origin insertion and its action so i'll come up with a new topic in anatomy thank you